the short and extraordinary life of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And uh, we don't have a sponsor today, but I'm going to dedicate it in honor of my two newly born grandchildren. Thank you very much. One, Miri, who just arrived today from New York with her parents for the bris tomorrow morning of my other grandchild, my grandson, and I can't say his name because he doesn't have one yet. But um, we'll dedicate this evening's learning um, in their honor, and uh, may they grow up for chupa, Torah, and Masim Tovin. If you were to ask an average Jewish person who knows something about Jewish life, I'm not talking about somebody who's totally ignorant of Judaism, tell me a few facts about Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. You'd probably draw a blank. People, most people have heard the name Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and I mean Breslov Hasidim, I, th I think we've got a nice image here of ecstatic, wide-eyed, dancing Hasidim with massive white wool yarmulkes. Um, and they go to Uman every Rosh Hashanah, and they dance. I was there one year. It is quite incredible. 25, 30,000 Hasidim from all over the world come together to Uman. We're going to hear more about that later, why they would go there. That's where Rabbi Nachman of Breslov is buried. But who is he? What, what is so attractive about a man who died in 1810 that more than 200 years later, people are still talking about him, visiting his grave in such large numbers? Uh, who are Breslov Hasidim? What do they believe in? Who was Rabbi Nachman of Breslov? And I, I, in particular, I want to ask the question, I think that we're going to hopefully understand some of it during the course of this lecture. Um, what is so different about Breslov as opposed to other Hasidic groups? What makes them different? What makes Reb Nachman unique? And in order to understand Breslov, we need to understand Reb Nachman himself, the individual. Who was he and how did he make such an impact? Let's begin the story, if I may, with um, the story of the origins of the Hasidic movement. Uh, and we've not really spoken about it before in my series of lectures. Um, we've never really discussed the Hasidic movement. It, it comes up as a side topic, but let's focus some attention, three, four, five minutes, on the Hasidic movement, which was founded in the mid-1700s by a man called Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. And he was the founder of Hasidism. He was also Rabbi Nachman of Breslov's great-grandfather. Um, he was born in 1700, uh, around. We don't know, we don't have a, an exact birth date. It could be he was born in 1698. It could be he was born in 1702, but roughly 1700. We know he died in 1760. And in fact, the truth is, we know very little about Rabbi Yisrael Bar Shem Tov, at least from accurate historical sources. We, there's a lot of hagiographic material. Hagiography, by the way, is what people who love someone write about them. So if you want hagiography, you hear a eulogy at a funeral, that's going to be hagiography. We're not going to hear at a funeral about how somebody you know, wasn't particularly nice or wasn't particularly charitable or wasn't particularly special. Hagiography abounds about Rabbi Yisrael Bar Shem Tov. In fact, the kind of hagiography that is so unbelievable and so incredible that we don't, uh, we don't find it that believable. We find it extremely difficult to believe. Um, miraculous stories, things that he did, um, ideas that he came up with, which were repeated by his, uh, by his disciples and followers. And it wasn't until 1815 when a book came out called Shivchei Habesht, by the way, 1815, just to give you some, it's, it's 55 years after he died, and it was four generations later. Reb Nachman of Breslov himself had already died. He was a great-grandson. So th that is the first biographical book that we have of Rabbi Yisrael Bar Shem Tov. Um, we do have some empirical evidence, though. He did exist. That's important to know, by the way. He did exist, and we know that from his tax records. Uh, the IRS followed people everywhere, even in Podolia, in, ancient, in, in, the, in the historic Poland. And um, if we look here at, can you see that record? It's not very clear. The name on that is Balsam. He lived at 95, house number 95 in the Jewish district 
in, uh, in um, his town. And note there that he never paid tax. <laughs> and the reason he didn't pay tax is because he was employed by the city. I'm going to get to the city in a minute. We know he exists, but where did he come from? He was born in Podolia. Podolia is at the very east side of historic Poland. Today it's no longer Poland, it's Ukraine. Um, he was orphaned at a young age and became an itinerant teacher of children. He studied Kabbalah, apparently, according to the traditions within the Hasidic world, with a man called Adam Balshem. We have no record of somebody called Adam Balshem. So we don't really know who he is. There's a lot of speculation. If you read books about Kabbalah and Hasidism, there's a lot of speculation as to who this great Adam Baal Shem was. He's a mysterious figure, but he's cited as the teacher who introduced Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov to Kabbalah. And the secrets of Kabbalah, which we've discussed in the past, had gone through a pretty rough patch in the previous hundred years. Since Shabtai Tzvi, People were not recommended to study Kabbalah if they wanted to survive in the mainstream Jewish world. But that message hadn't percolated all the way through to the eastern end of Poland. And there was a particular problem in the, uh, in the 1700s with Kabbalah being studied in that section of Poland, which resulted ultimately in something called the Frankist movement, which... The Baal Shem Tov had something to do with in as much as that he debated the Frankists. Jacob Frank, we're going to get to him a little bit later, was, a, was somebody who claimed that he was the reincarnation of Shabbatai Tzvi. He was the Messiah, used Kabbalah as a way of attracting people to his form of Judaism, his sect of Judaism. We'll get to that later on. But at some point in the 1730s, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov was engaged as a Magid, an itinerant preacher um, in Medjibush. Medjibush is a, I've been there, it's in this, in the end of the Ukraine. Um, it's today a small town. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that in America we'd call it a town, maybe a township. I don't know how many people live there. I can't imagine many people live there in his lifetime, but uh, a few hundred families probably, and probably half the population was Jewish. He wasn't the rabbi of the town, he was the Magid. What's the difference between a rabbi and a Magid? The rabbi of the town presided over all the Jewish legal matters that took place. Marriages, divorces, kashrut, conversion, if that ever came up. And the Magid was the person who gave the speeches. He was the person who was the sermonizer. He was the person who inspired people Jewishly. And it would seem that the Baal Shem Tov was a man who could inspire. He not only inspired people locally in Medjibush, he also inspired people from the cities and towns which surrounded the area, in fact, from towns very far away. His reputation was very, um, very wide. He was known for his ability to weave Torah ideas into contemporary life and to refresh people Jewishly, to give them hope, to give them joy, and particularly, he developed this idea which became known as Hasidism. He gathered around him a group of rabbis who were eager to change things. He was a very influential person. And at that stage, there was no what we would consider movement. There was no Hasidic movement. It was a group of people who were looking to change things. Like-minded rabbis, scholars who wanted to reboot Jewish life. What was wrong with Jewish life, it depends which scholar you look at as to what they think was the particular problem, problem that the Baal Shem Tov and his friends were coming to solve. Maybe it was an economic crisis, maybe there was a crisis uh, because after Shabtai Tzvi and various pogroms, people just felt depressed and these people came and invigorated their Jewish life. Perhaps there was an intellectual crisis, you know, people were not in touch with the Jewish leadership because they found them too intellectual and too out of touch. They wanted people to whom they could relate. It doesn't really matter what the problem was, but the solution was the Hasidic movement. The Hasidic movement was a people movement. It was a movement, it wasn't an anti-intellectual movement, so it didn't reject Jewish um, study or the study of Talmud. It used Kabbalah as a vehicle and very basic Kabbalah as a vehicle to make people feel connected to Judaism, to the acts of Judaism, the mitzvot, and to God. 
And I don't want to go into the details. That's probably the subject of a, 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 a very different type of lecture. But just understand that this was a movement that became more and more popular during the Baal Shem Tov's life and then really um, spread very far and very wide and very deep after he died. So the key elements of Hasidism were the rejection of elitism and bringing spirituality into the heart of daily Jewish life. So to understand that, we need to know, like many revolutions, and Hasidism was a revolution, it wasn't really new. There's nothing in Hasidism which is so original that you could say, one second, we've never seen that before in Jewish life. How are you introducing it into Jewish life? That makes no sense. It was revolutionary only in as much as that it made that the focus of Jewish life. The strong emphasis on that which was previously unemphasized or underemphasized. For example, the focus was on giving meaning to mundane mitzvot and regular prayers, infusing everything with joy and with the presence of God. That was something which was lacking in Jewish life. Even if it existed, it wasn't mainstream. And they brought this into the mainstream. And Hasidism spread from Podolia, in this east, eastern region of Poland, throughout Poland and parts of Russia. I think we have a map there, just to see how far and how wide Hasidism spread. Now, I, I could go on and on about Hasidism, and perhaps one day we will have a lecture to describe the different geographic regions of the Hasidic world and the impact that each particular Hasidic leader had on his or their regions. Um, not for today. Today we're going to focus on Breslov, on the family of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, the Besht as he was known, that is the acronym of his name, had two children, at least who survived into childhood. One was called Odl, it was a daughter. Um, the other one was Svi Hirsch, that was his son. Odl was Reb Nachman's grandmother, was married to somebody called Rabbi Yechiel of Tulchin. Tulchin was very close by to Medjibush. And in fact, you find that all the different names of cities and towns I'm going to mention are very close by. In a sense, this entire story is very parochial. Parochial because I would suspect that had you asked the great rabbis of that generation, let's think of some great rabbis in that generation who you've all heard of, the Chassam Sofer, or Rabbi Akiva Eger, in the life of Reb Nachman of Breslov. You would ask them, have you heard of Reb Nachman of Breslov? They would have said no. They never would have heard of him. He lived in eastern Poland, and he, that's where he operated. In eastern Poland, the family of the Baal Shem Tov was extremely important. It could even be that in central Poland, they were well known, or somewhat known. But if the, as you got further and further west, or if you got into what we would today call Western Europe, no one would have heard in Germany, or in Holland, or in France, or in, uh, in the part, many parts of Western Poland or Lithuania, they may not have heard of Reb Nachman of Breslov. These, this was a local rabbinic leader or local Hasidic leader. They will have heard of the Baal Shem Tov because he founded the Hasidic movement and that became very controversial. And there was a, an entire movement or counter movement that emerged against the Hasidic movement that was known as the Mitnagdim. Mitnagdim means those who were against, those who were opposed, the opponents to Hasidism. They were generally very conservative, um, not wishing to change things, not wishing to rock the boat. And they saw great danger, grave danger in the Hasidic movement, having just managed to beat back the forces of Shabtai Tzvi and Jacob Frank and all the other um, characters who emerged who were a danger to normative Judaism, suddenly they see this new group which is emerging and capturing the hearts, hearts and minds of so many Jews, and they were concerned that this was a movement that similarly would destroy Judaism, and they were opposed to them. That was the Baal Shem Tov. Perhaps they will have heard of his primary Talmidim, but Rav Nachman of Breslov was a local rabbi in that, in that area. Um, they had... So, Rabbi Yechiel married Odl, and they had three children. Rabbi Baruch of Mezhibush, who we're going to come back to. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ephraim of Sudilkov. He wrote a very famous sefer, which Hasidim and non-Hasidim are familiar with, called Degel Machne Ephraim. 
It has a particular connection to my family because Sabine is a direct descendant of the Degel Machne Ephraim and therefore of the Baal Shem Tov. And my children are all descendants from the Baal Shem Tov, which makes, by the way, Reb Nachman of Breslev, I don't know, a cousin, a great uncle, something. Some, I'm talking about my relative here. And they had a third child called Fega. Both sons became what we, in, in the early Hasidic movement was referred to as tzaddikim. A tzaddik wasn't a rabbi. A tzaddik was a righteous individual who was an inspiration to the Jewish world. And Raborach of Mezhibosh was a tzaddik in Mezhibosh. And, and the uh, Moshe Chaim Ephraim, the Degel Machne Ephraim, was the tzaddik in Sudilkov. In fact, at some point, he retired from that position and he moved back to Mejibush, where he sat and studied for the rest of his life. He's buried in Mejibush. I've been to his, his uh, burial place, as I've been to Reboruch, and the Baal Shem Tov is buried there as well. And Fega and her husband um, are buried there as well, Simcha. Um, uh, no, Simcha is, is Reb Nachman's, is Reb Nachman's father. Um, yeah. So Simcha was the son of somebody called Reb Nachman of Horodenka. Reb Nachman of Horodenka is also an interesting man. So the Baal Shem Tov had many different disciples who, sp who spread out in different cities and towns. Some of them traveled to Israel. In those days, that wasn't a normal thing to do. And people didn't just go on Aliyah. You didn't phone up Nefesh Benefesh and say, I'd like to go on Aliyah. It was quite a, quite a journey. In fact, the Baal Shem Tov himself tried to go um, to Eretz Yisrael, and he came to Istanbul, and he never made it further. But some of his Talmudim did manage to go. One of them was Reb Nachman of Horodenka, who made it to Tveria in 1764, and he died the following year, and he's buried in Tveria. That was Reb Nachman of Breslov's grandfather, that after whom he was named. His father, his father was Simcha, married to Fega, who was the daughter of Odl, who was the daughter of the Baal Shem Tov. That's how he was the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov died, and the most prominent member of his circle took the lead. So it's interesting. You remember he had a son called Tzvi Hirsch. Tzvi Hirsch didn't take over. So today, what's the normal model in the Hasidic world? That one or another, or sometimes several, children take the mantle of their father. Sometimes it can be a son-in-law, the husband of a daughter. But that's the normal thing. It's a hereditary um, honor that you, as the son of your father, or sometimes grandson, inherit the title of whatever city your father or grandfather was the Rebbe, the Tzaddik of. The Baal Shem Tov had a son, Tzvi Hirsch. You would have assumed that he would take over, but he did not take over. The person who took over was a man called Reb Dov Ber, the Maggid of Mezrich. Mezrich is another town in that region. The Maggid of Mezrich became the progenitor, the founder of a quite a Hasidic dynasty. Today you have many descendants of, of the Mezrich and Maggid in various Hasidic communities. Most famously you have Vizhnitz, they're descended from the Mezrich and Maggid. You also have Sadiger, Sadiger Rijin, and the various branches of that particular family who are descended from the Mezrich and Magid. He seems to have been a very powerful personality and very different than the Baal Shem Tov. Whereas the Baal Shem Tov was inspirational, he was an organizer, he was practical, he was a manager, and he was visited. We have very important evidence from a man called Solomon Maimon. Solomon Maimon was a Lithuanian scholar, an itinerant Lithuanian philosopher savant. And he meandered around Europe until he ended up in Germany, where he became very famous because he wrote the best exposition on, of Kant in his day. Even though he was born only into a family that only spoke Yiddish, he taught himself German, taught himself Russian, taught himself Polish. He was a multilingual genius. But in his younger years, after he got married, apparently at the age of 17, he traveled to see different leaders and inspiring figures within the Jewish world. One of the people he went to see 
was the Maggid of Mezrich. Interesting that he would have gone to see him, and he was captivate, captivated by him, not just by his followers. Um, he was captivated by the personality of the Maggid of Mezrich, who apparently, he said, dressed in white, stayed at home the whole week, never came out of his room. Shabbos, he would emerge, people would surround him, and he would preside over what we would today call a tish, a shulchan, you know, where all the Hasidim gather around and would sing. He would give them divrei Torah. He would offer pithy comments on the various aspects of his, of his followers' lives. He would offer them advice if they sought it, and then he would disappear back into his room for the remainder of the week. The only people he would see were the people who he felt were important as uh, Hasidic plants in various cities and towns around his region and beyond. Um, Solomon Maimon heard him speak, was very impressed with his speech. What he would do when he spoke is he would ask all the people in front of him to quote him a pasuk from Tanakh, any verse from Tanakh. And I, get, I don't know how many people were in front of him, maybe he would get a collection of 20 different pasukim. And then he would weave all of these psukim into one sermon, and each one of the psukim would somehow follow the other and would make coherent sense. It would be one sermon. A brilliant public speaker, a brilliant darshan is what you would call it in Hebrew. And in fact, that's why he's known as the Mezritcher Magid, a very, um, a very talented speaker. My mom was disdainful of the relationship that the Maggid had with his followers. So it's interesting, he writes that the Mezrich of Maggid was very manipulative and regressive. Rather than being a revolutionary, he found him a little oppressive in the way that he ran his Hasidic group. And the Maggid was a great organizer. By the time he died, he had trained a third generation of rabbis to spread Hasidism beyond Podolia, and they went all the way through to Central Poland, we know of the Seer of Lublin, we know of um, uh, the various Hasidic rabbis in Warsaw, and even Hasidic rabbis who traveled as far as the coast, the Baltic coast, and opened Hasidic groups there. One of these rabbis, who was of the third generation, was this Rabbi Boruch of Medjibush, a grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. He was Reb Nachman of Breslov's uncle. And he set up a court in Tulchin. Much later on in his life, towards the end of his life, he moved to Medjibush. But he was in Tulchin, which is not far from Medjibush. Let me tell you a little bit about Reboruch. Reboruch was a complex personality. He was the first um, Hasidic Rebbe that we would recognize in that form. Uh, he inherited his title because of his family connections. And he embodied this concept of Bestian Hasidism. By that I mean that he didn't focus on the intellectual. I'm sure that he was a very wise and scholarly man. That's not uh, uh, anything to discuss. But that's not what the focus of his Hasidic group was. The Baal Shem Tov had stressed, as I said earlier, the importance of utilizing the physical material world in the service of God. Self-denial asceticism were disapproved of. No freezing cold mikveh, for example. Um, no fasting. So the first Talmidim, the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov, came from this background that if they wanted to improve themselves spiritually, if they wanted to be more religious, they would go to a freezing cold mikveh every morning, sometimes 15 times a day. Or they would fast for days on end. They would only eat on Shabbat. He was against that. Joy through living life to the fullest. And Reboruch of Mezhibosh really represented that. He had the first Hasidic court, which was extremely ostentatious. It was regal. He was more like a Polish nobleman than a city rabbi. And Hasidim came from all over to pay homage to this rabbi. The rabbi of a town was almost a functionary, a very respected functionary. But the Rebbe, a tzaddik, was someone to whom you paid homage, to whom you, you, you visited and gave money to, and sought his attention, it was a totally different relationship. Rabbi Baruch of Mezhibosh was the first one to represent this ideal. And his Hasidim were compelled to give large sums of money to sustain this opulent court. 
Money was the oxygen by which it functioned. Um, thousands flocked from all over to see him. And he was a very jealous rabbi. That means he wasn't happy if you followed some other rabbi. Because if you followed another rabbi, that means you weren't, follow, you weren't following him. And he was very critical of those who he felt were drifting away from him or weren't paying him the proper respect. He insulted them, he would curse them, he marginalized them. And this included other Hasidic rabbis. Everyone was considered a rival in this setup. So, for example, the first rabbi of Lubavitch, you may have heard of, Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi. He was of this same generation. He was marginalized. He tried to reconcile with Rabbi Baruch of Mezhibush, but Rabbi Baruch apparently, in various reports that we have of this encounter, lost his temper and threw him out. Had him evicted from the court, and they never spoke to each other again. His mood swings were so bad that either he or someone in his family or group, his followers, engaged a comedian, a court jester, who would be there to cheer him up. His name was Herschel of Ostropol. And his entire job was to cheer up Raboruch and not to make, and make him less angry because he was in such a bad mood. Here you see a more modern depiction of Herschel of Ostropol. He was a very humorous man. And in fact, many of his jokes have been recorded. And you can, you can find them online. The jokes of Herschel of Ostropol, Herschel Ostropolia. Rab Nachman's approach to his great-grandfather's movement was strongly influenced by Rab Baruch in the negative. He grew up around Rab Baruch of Mezhibush. His introduction to Bestian, as it were, Bestian Hasidism, was through his uncle, the medium by which he learnt what it meant to be a Hasid, was through his uncle Rab Baruch and what he saw he didn't like at all. Rab Nachman's mother, as I said, married Reb Simcha, Reb Nachman Horodenka's son. Um, him, Reb Simcha, was, had been adopted by the Baal Shem Tov when his mother died. He was just a month old when his mother died. And he married Fager in 1763. He was just 13 years old. He had four children. Um, he had one son called Reb Yisrael, the dead. The reason he's called Reb Yisrael the dead is because at some point... The Toiter, by the way, in Yiddish. Rabbi Yisrael the Toiter. He was the oldest son. At some point, they thought he died. And they went crazy. What do you mean? How can he die? And they brought him to the graveside of the Baal Shem Tov, and they left him there. He's dead. We're leaving him there for the Baal Shem Tov to take care of. And in the morning, he was alive. Maybe he'd never died, right? But they saw this as a great miracle, that he'd been revived through the proximity to his great-grandfather, and for the rest of his life he was known as Rabbi Yisrael de Teuter. The second son was Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And he was not the oldest, so he was not destined for anything. I mean, even his father had not particularly destined for anything. And, as we said, there was no hereditary set up in those days. Reb Baruch was the all-powerful uncle who controlled the family business. And Reb Nachman was left to his own devices. If you look at all the sources that are produced by Breslov in that time and in the decades that followed, during Rabbi Nachman's life and after he died, it would appear that Rabbi Nachman did not have a happy childhood. He was a miserable child. He was miserable because he could never find his place. He spoke about it a lot in later years. He clearly was highly intelligent, very, very bright. They didn't have teachers for him. He must have learned how to read and to translate Hebrew and must have had some basic rudimentary training in the study of, of Tanakh and in the study of Talmud. He never had a teacher that we are aware of who taught him Kabbalah, but he seems to be very familiar with it. He familiarized himself with Kabbalah and he was precocious and had a sense of destiny about him, which is quite incredible. It started at a very young age. Um, he struggled to find his peace. 
He couldn't be peaceful in himself. He wanted a relationship with God from a very young age. And unlike his great-grandfather's teaching, he sought this path through denying himself worldly pleasures. That was his method. The very method that had been rejected by his great-grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov, was the one that he embraced. He would come very late at night and visit his great-grandfather's grave. He would regularly dunk himself in freezing cold mikvahs. And he would swallow food without chewing it first because he didn't want to take any pleasure from eating. And Baruch had no sons. So it is possible that Rabbi Nachman was considered a possible heir, but he shunned attention and he also made a point, something that would recur throughout his life, of pretending that he wasn't very much. He's not very bright and he's not very intelligent, he doesn't know very much, and if people suspected him of being intelligent, he would start acting the fool or saying provocative things, annoying people. He tried his best to avoid getting attention for being special. And this was his habit. He was a prankster. Meanwhile, when no one was looking, he feverishly studied and prayed, all in private. He had no friends, just a small circle of those who knew him. Shortly after his bar mitzvah, also age 13, he married his first wife, Sasya. Sasya was the daughter of a man called Ephraim of Huzyatin. Huzyatin is a tiny little village town um, in a more rural area. I don't know how you get more rural, but it is more rural than the place where he'd been brought up. He was brought up in Mejibush, and he moved there after he got married. It was an idyllic period. He loved the open air. He loved fields. He loved forests. And he was no longer in the middle of a crowd. Nobody knew who he was. He was a young 13, 14, 15-year-old boy in a town where nobody particularly cared for him or perhaps his family, and he would disappear, and he lived in his in-law's house. They provided him with food and lodging, and he would disappear to the forest, to the fields, and he would study on his own and without any attention. Later on, he would write, and he would say to his disciples, if only I could be back in that setting of Uziatin, what a wonderful place it was for me to live. On the day of his wedding, he befriended a young man who was slightly older than him, a man called Shimon, Shimon ben Ber. Shimon, from that day on, became his full-time attendant. That means there was nothing that Nachman, Reb Nachman, wanted that he wouldn't get for him. He became what's known in the, um, in the Hasidic world, his Shamus, Meshamash Bakodesh. He looked after his every need. We don't know much about who Shimon was, where he came from, who his family was, we really don't know because much later on, in 1802, a new man would enter the scene called Reb Nossen of Nemirov and he really took over the Breslov legacy and those who had been close to Reb Nachman before he came onto the scene um, were airbrushed out, not in the sense that they no longer appeared in any of the historic records, but they were no longer part of the the main body of the Breslov Hasidim after Ibn Nachman died, he died in 1810. And um, as a result of that, we don't know much about Reb Shimon. We know a lot about Reb Nossen of Nemirov. We know nothing almost about Reb Shimon. But he was a very important man. For the next 17 years, he accompanied Reb Nachman of Breslov wherever he went. He attended to every one of his needs. And Reb Nachman's intense behavior he's now a teenager, intensified in Uziatin. He did not eat from Shabbos to Shabbos. He would only drink. He rolled in the snow. He would allow, allow insects to bite him. This is all stuff that was reported by Shimon and recorded by Reb Nossen of Nemirov much later. Reb Nachman saw life as a battlefield. And the greatest battle, as far as Reb Nachman was concerned, he began speaking about it in his teenage years, was in the field of his sexual desires. This theme would dominate his writings. When I say dominate, you have to understand, other Hasidic rabbis, other rabbis write about the battle that human beings, and particularly men, have with sexual desires. But with Reb Nachman of Breslov, it became a central theme, something which he felt 
was so compelling and so important that he wrote about it again and again. And he claims to have constantly battled sexual lust and distractions. But rather than try to avoid these tests, he embraced them to conquer them. And these are quotes. I've got quotes um, which I've taken from Shivchei Moharan, Likute Moharan. He longed to be tested and prayed to God to test him again. He was confident he would not rebel against God. His writings on the dangers of sexual lust and particularly masturbation exceed any other Hasidic writer on this subject. Far from turning him into a celibate, though, Reb Nachman had eight children. The last one was born in 1806, just four years before he died. I produced, with the help of uh, Kali, a family tree of Reb Nachman of Breslov. There you see Reb Simcha and Fege at the top. They had three children besides for Reb Nachman. Reb Nachman married his first wife, Sasya. Um, she died in 1807. His second wife, whose name we don't know, her name was possibly Devorah, was the daughter of Rabbi Cheskel Trachtenberg from Brody. Um, she survived him. And there we have his eight children, some of whom lived into adulthood. Only four lived into adulthood, and four of them uh, died in infancy. Um, the most unusual aspect of Rabbi Nachman's approach that emerged during this period, before the age of 20, was this concept of life as a struggle. I don't think that you need to be a great expert on Hasidic leaders to know that if you read any book or article or know anything about a Hasidic rabbi, they're always painted as being completely perfect. They've never done anything wrong. At the age of two, they were already perfect. At the age of five, they were fluent in the entire, entire Tanakh. At the age of eight, they knew the entire Talmud. At the age of 12, people were streaming from across the world to see them. That's the way a Hasidic Rebbe is painted in all the literature that we have about them. They're destined for greatness. They're virtuous. They're pure. They're superlative. Rabbi Nachman is not portrayed that way. Very, very unusual. He's portrayed as someone who is in constant struggle. He has potential for greatness, but he needs to work hard to get there. This is what his primary disciple, Reb Nosson of Nemirov, has to say about his revered teacher. I've split it up into various slides. I'm going to read it for you. No act in the service of God came easily to him. Everything came only as a result of incessant struggles. He rose and fell thousands and thousands of times, countless times. He would try to serve God for a few days, then he would fall. And he would go back, start over, then fall again. We're talking about Hasidic Rebbe here, not the average man, your friend, who you know, who you stand next to in shul. This is Reb Nachman of Breslov, and it's written by his most fervent and devoted disciple. He continues, ultimately... After many such cycles, he would be strong and decide to remain committed to the service of God forever. Nothing in the world would lead him astray. But afterwards, he would still experience more rises and falls. He would start anew each time it happened. When he fell from his rung, he would not allow himself to despair. Instead, he would start again from the beginning, as if he had never before entered the service of God. Sometimes he would have several such starts in just one day. You know who Reb Nachman is? Reb Nachman is the Rebbe for the ordinary man. He's a Rebbe for you and me. Even the greatest sinner can aspire to be like him. It's a struggle to get to perfection. We can all relate to that. Unlike other Rebbes who are picture perfect in every way, at least that is how they're presented, Reb Nachman is not picture perfect. Constantly goes through the same problems as everyone else. And he writes about them and talks about them. He goes through depressions. He goes through uh, periods where he suffers from sexual desires. You name it, he struggles with it. And the message is, he prevails. That's Reb Nachman's message. His greatness is not in his perfection. It is in his ability to prevail over his imperfections. That is the attraction of Reb Nachman, by the way, to this day. If you want to understand why people still feel 
connected to Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and they don't feel that connected to many of the other great rabbis who lived in his era, Hasidic or otherwise, it's because he speaks to them. When they read about his struggles, they read about their struggles, and then when they read about the fact that he managed to overcome those struggles, it gives them hope that they will overcome theirs. In 1790, 18-year-old Rabbi Nachman arranged for his widowed father-in-law to remarry. He was a shadchan as well, as well as everything else. The wedding was in Mogilev Podolsky. He was just 18 years old. And his father-in-law, very proud of him, he's got a son-in-law as a scholar, he says to him, you be my best man and you give the drosha at the chasna. And it seems Rab Nachman had a little bit to drink, a bit too much vodka, and he got up and he spoke and he blew everyone away. For the first time, they came face to face with the genius Rab Nachman, the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. No one had seen him in this light before. They never knew that this young man was so special because he always kept himself under wraps. He was incognito, he was anonymous. And as a result of that, he made such a powerful impression that he attracted followers. This Shimon was his first follower, but he began to attract other followers. And he couldn't move back to his father-in-law's house because of the new mother-in-law. And he moved to a town called Medvedevka, and there the followers started to come. Not in droves. He was a, a small local Hasidic leader, this wasn't a major scene, but he began to attract attention. And he was different than his uncle. He said, I'm not like you, Uncle Baruch. I'm not interested in wealthy supporters. I don't need a court. I don't need money. I just want those supporters who are pious and real. I'm not looking for fake. I'm looking for real. And it was a break with the developing culture of Hasidism, which saw the tzaddik as a perfect human being supported by Hasidim. The Rebbe of Kotsk, by the way, led a very similar campaign 40 years later in Poland. But Rabbi Nachman was a pioneer. And there's a word for it in English, a word which, if you're looking for one word to define Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, it's this word in English. He was an iconoclast. He took icons and he broke them down. And even icons that he himself had built, he would then take them and destroy them, break them down to their components and rebuild them. He was not interested in just living by an ideal that had preceded him. He wanted to examine it and rebuild it. And he wasn't interested in being himself a regal figure on a pedestal. He didn't want followers who were not on a path of growth. Being a follower of Rab Nachman, I can tell you, if you read all the stuff that's written about him, things that he said, it was not easy to be a follower of Rab Nachman of Breslov. You, you wouldn't run to him. You'd prefer, actually, to take out your checkbook and be a follower of Rab Boruch. It's much easier to write a check than to be challenged by somebody who's trying to make you greater than the sum of your parts. And... Um, I want to now turn, you know, there's so much I could say about Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and about the era in which he lived. I want to focus on one particular incident in his life, which was a pivotal point, and that was his visit to Eretz Yisrael. In, uh, took just over a year, between 1798 and 1799. We have here a map of the Ottoman Empire. Can you see Podolia there in the top left corner? Ukraine, Podolia. And can you see all the way down at the bottom in the center, Syria, Damascus, Jerusalem? That was the journey. By sea and by foot, by horse and cart, that Rabbi Nachman took. And now I'm going to tell you about that incredible journey. As I said earlier, the Baal Shem Tov, his great-grandfather, tried to get there. Got as far as Istanbul, Constantinople. And for some reason, we were never quite clear as to why, he felt unable to continue, went back to where he came from and never went. He wrote letters and said he regrets the fact that he wasn't able to make it. This is around 1750. But his great-grandson felt a very important need to visit Eretz Yisrael. The various reasons have been given. 
You know, the first Hasidim to move to Eretz Yisrael were in 1747. That was even before his grandfather, Rabbi Nachman of Haradenko, went in 1764, was buried there. That's where he is. The two Hasidic leaders who were in what was known as Syria-Palestine in those days were two Rabbi Avram of Kalisk and Rabbi Nachman Mendel of Vitebsk. And they were disciples of the Mezritcher Magid, and they went in 1777 and they settled in Tiberia, Tiberias, in the north of Israel on the Sea of Galilee. And around Pesach time, 1798, Rabbi Nachman announced that he was going on a pilgrimage to Eretz Yisrael. And he left on the 4th of May, the 18th of the ER, and his family said, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? How are we going to support ourselves? He said to his wife, it's really important that I go. You're going to have to work in a co as a cook in somebody's house. He told his children to go to work. He said to one of his children, listen, if you have nowhere to leave, people will take pity in you, on you and they'll take you in. He was so determined to go that he raised enough money for his ticket or for whatever he thought it was going to cost him. He gave a bit of money to his family and he went off to Eretz Yisrael. Before leaving, he went on what the Breslov Hasidim considered to be a very mysterious trip to a place called Kamenetz, which wasn't far away. The reason why it's strange that he went there is that no Jews lived there. The only Jews who lived there were followers of Jacob Frank, who had converted to Catholicism. And perhaps the Breslov Hasidim speculate that he went to cleanse Kamenetz of this, of this uh, spiritual dirt, and he needed to do that. He needed to go through this cathartic moment for the city of Kamenetz before he could go on his journey to Eretz Yisrael. He stopped in Mezhibush to say goodbye to his parents. And his traveling companion was the faithful Shimon. And instead of traveling from Galati, I don't know if you can see on the map. Or we still, can we go back to the map? So on the map, if you see the Black Sea there, where it says... Um, Bessarabia in, in the middle there that's somewhere to the south of that is Odessa Galati is even further south on the coast Galati is the mouth of the Danube River and that was the place generally where people travelled down the Black Sea to Istanbul and from Istanbul they would go um, to Eretz Yisrael to Israel, Palestine on a ship and he traveled from Odessa, strange, there were very few Jews in Odessa, but I, I would think that the reason why he traveled from Odessa and not from Galati is because a year before, a mob murdered the Jews of Galati. There was a terrible pogrom there, and some of them ran into the Danube and uh, drowned. Others were burnt alive in the shul. The only Jews who survived this terrible pogrom in 1797 was a group of 70 who were rescued by the local bishop and hidden in the church. But that's perhaps a story for another time. The four-day journey across the Black Sea was stormy. And in Istanbul, it turned out that there were no ships going to Palestine. And they stuck. This young man, he's in his 20s, together with Shimon, doesn't speak the language, is dressed very strangely because everybody's dressed like Turks, and he's dressed like a Polish nobleman, I guess, whatever it was that he wore, perhaps a commoner. And he's wandering around in the Jewish community, and people asked him, who are you? What's your name? He refused to tell anyone his name. He wouldn't. He told Shimon, you dare tell anyone my name. You mustn't tell anybody who I am or what I'm doing here. He's a rabbi from a famous family. I mean, he's traveling to Eretz Israel. If he told people who he was, they would give him great respect. Every time he was in company, he would behave really strangely. And there was an associate of Rabbi Avram of Kalisk there from Tiberia who was on his way to raise money in Poland. And he was desperate to find out who this strange person was. He said, well, what's your name? And one day he told him, my name is Cohen. Oh, very good. So the next day they were leaning from the Sefer Torah. He said, I'd like to call you up for Cohen. He said, no, no, I'm not a Cohen. Yes, they told me you are a Cohen. No, no, no. He said, I'm the Kamarna Rebbe's son. Well, the Commander Rebbe's son. What's your name? I can't tell you. The next day he said, I'm not the Commander Rebbe's son. He's driving the guy crazy. And the guy's desperate to know who he was. And he begins to think that he's there to make trouble in Eretz Yisrael. He's traveling 
as one of the enemies of the Hasidic group in Palestine, and he's going to make trouble. He refuses to give him food, and he makes his life very, very difficult. To the extent that eventually, when he left, and people were just not being very supportive of Rabbi Nachman, he told another traveling pilgrim who he was, Rabbi Zev Wolf of Charni Ostraha, who was also traveling to Eretz Yisrael, he confided in him and he said, I'm Nachman, I'm Rabbi Baruch of Mezhibosh's nephew, I'm the Baal Shem Tov's great-grandson. Oh, suddenly he got a lot of respect. Now, I said earlier, and I kind of didn't focus on it, that the, there were no ships to Eretz Yisrael. Well, how was he going to get there? Why were there no ships? You see, in 1798, there was a young general from France called Napoleon Bonaparte. And he had decided that he was going to launch a military campaign in the Middle East to take over all the, mi uh, the Middle East holdings of the Ottoman Empire. And he started in Egypt. There was an unbelievable campaign in Egypt in which he conquered Egypt. And there were troops that were making their way south through Syria that were going to attack Napoleon's army in Egypt. And there was also a rush of the Royal Navy from Great Britain and the French fleet and the Ottoman fleet through the Mediterranean. They were heading towards, guess where? Eretz Yisrael, to Israel, to Palestine, because that was the center of this great battle. All the great battles of the Middle East have always found the land mass of Eretz Yisrael caught in the middle. And no ship wanted to travel because they felt very rightly that the chances were that they would be attacked. If they had the Turkish flag, the French would attack them and therefore no ship would travel. And it could have been that Reb Nachman of Breslau would never have got to Eretz Yisrael, but there seems to have been an elderly Sephardic Chacham in Istanbul, very respected, an old man. And he went to the community leaders and he said, listen, you can't allow me not to go to Eretz Yisrael because it could be that I'll die before I go on this journey. And I've made it my vow to get to Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, it's up to you to organize a ship for me. They had such respect for him that they organized a ship for this Sephardic Chacham. And Rabbi Nachman of Breslov got onto that ship and they traveled towards Eretz Yisrael. Not concerned with risking his life, the ship soon encountered a terrible storm and the boat was apparently in danger of going under. Everyone screamed and shouted. Rabbi Nachman, meanwhile, remained completely calm. Shimon reported this to Rabbi Nachman. He said, you can't believe this guy just was coming. The boat's rocking from side to side, people screaming, people not quite sure that they would make it out of this, uh, this trouble alive. And he's doing nothing. And they said, Rabbi, why are you so calm? He said, if you're calm, the sea will be calm. If you're excited, the sea will be excited. Well, we've got nothing else to try. So everyone calm down. And within an hour, the storm had subsided. Now, I can't tell you whether this is a miracle or not. We're just reporting what's being reported to us. But he was a person who had incredible self-control. That's what it does tell you. A person with incredible self-control and self-belief. And he traveled on this ship. And they came to Jaffa. And in the port in Jaffa, they were very nervous of this strange-looking man from Poland. They wouldn't let him off the boat nor him, nor Shimon, and they went up the coast until they got to Haifa. <coughs> it was Erev Rosh Hashanah, September 10th, 1798. Think about it. He left in May, June, July, August, September. Took him four months. We complain about a 12-hour flight or 16-hour flight to Israel. Four months to get to Israel. Rab Nachman arrives in Israel, gets off the boat, in Haifa, and he is so overjoyed, he tells Shimon, he says, I've realized my dream, I came to Eretz Yisrael, I've done what I want, this is just amazing, the most amazing experience of my life, let's go home. <laughs> and Shimon, in a rare display of disobedience, said, yeah, if you want to go by yourself, you can go home. <laughs> I'm staying, I didn't travel for four months, 
just to be here for five minutes. Well, Rav Nachman didn't want to travel on his own, and he stayed. Somehow, it was a big anticlimax for him. He got to Eretz Yisrael, and he became miserable, and he became depressed. Through Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, nobody could cheer him up. And Simchas Torah, usually he had danced. He was quite a vigorous dancer. He didn't, he didn't get up to dance. He wanted to leave. He kept on saying to Shimon, I want to go home. I don't want to go to Tiberias. I don't want to go to Jerusalem. He said, what are you talking about? Your grandfather's buried there. That's why you said you wanted to go. No, I don't need to go. I want to go home. And Shimon says, listen, we've come here already. Let's visit our friends. Let's visit the Hasidim who live in Tiberia. And this Reb Zev Wolf, of, uh, who had traveled with him, this other pilgrim, was also traveling there. And he went there together with him. And he, he visited the tomb of Reb Shimon Bar Yochai in Miron. And he got the youngsters to recite Zohar. He sang ecstatically. It seemed to cheer him up. He was very warmly welcomed by Reb Avraham of Kalisk. Later on, when he got back to Poland, and Reb Avraham of Kalisk was in the midst of a, of a terrible battle over money with Reb Shneer Zalman of Liadi, who was the founder of the Chabad Hasidic group. And he went and advocated for Reb Avraham Kalisk's position to Reb Shneer Zalman when he got back to Poland. He was very warmly welcomed there and they were very friendly towards him. He wouldn't speak in front of Rabbi Avram of Kalisk. He wanted him to speak. This was quite unusual for Reb Nachman of Breslov, who, as I said, was an iconoclast. He was not somebody who was interested in other people getting attention if he thought that they didn't deserve it. He f- clearly felt that Rabbi Avram of Kalisk deserved this attention. He never visited Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Came to Eretz Yisrael, never got to Jerusalem. Because Napoleon was heading north through the land. And in fact, let's look at Napoleon's military campaign. It's the most infamous of his career. Do you, anybody here read books about Napoleon? This is the, the most terrible of all his military campaigns. In early 1799, he'd captured Egypt by that time, he went on a ca- campaign against the Ottoman counter-offensive. So as I said, this army was coming south through Syria. He decided, I'm not going to wait for them to get to Egypt. I'm going to tackle them. I'm going to go towards them. He captured the garrison at El Arish. Then he went through Gaza. All familiar names, right? He went up the coast to Jaffa, where he, he reached Jaffa on March the 3rd. And he had to put Jaffa through a siege. Now, in ancient times, a siege, let's say in Roman times, a siege of Jerusalem, you know, they would have these catapults, they would send rocks against the walls, it depends how thick you built the walls. You see, that was before the age of cannons. With heavy artillery, and that's what um, Napoleon brought with him, it was much easier to uh, beat a defense, uh, um, a city which had defenses, ancient defenses. Jaffa was surrounded by walls, but walls which were not made to withstand the, um, uh, um, the attack from a cannon, from the, uh, artillery. Um, they sent a Turk, a so-called neutral Turk, to negotiate with the Turks in Jaffa, and they cut off the Turk's head and sent it back to Napoleon on a platter. Uh, he wasn't happy, as I guess he wouldn't be, um, and he managed to get into Jaffa on March the 7th, and after that, he said to his army, you're free to do whatever you want. And they went on a rampage of raping, looting, killing throughout Jaffa. And they took 4,500 Turkish prisoners. They weren't really Turks. They were Albanians and a you know, ragtag collection of mercenaries who worked for the Turkish um, army. And they didn't really know what to do with them. How are we going to supply them with food? How are we going to take care of them? It would be much easier to kill them. So they killed 4,500 Turkish soldiers. And they shot them, they beheaded them. Apparently they brought with an executioner from Egypt to take care of this. Even before they left, that had been their strategy. Anyway, he marched ahead and direction Haifa, Akka. Anyone here been to Akka, Akka, in the north of Israel? It's an ancient medieval um, fort city, still there. I was just there a few months ago. And it's the way Akko is, it's, it's like a, it projects out into the Mediterranean. You can only really get to it from, from one direction. It's 
quite high. You have to get it to either from the sea or you, from land. There's only a, a, um, one area of the of Akka that you can actually attack, and it's very, very well defended. In addition to which, by this time, thousands, tens of thousands of Turkish soldiers had made their way to Akka to repel Napoleon's attack. And in fact, this is where, even though he, he fought, he had a battle at Mount um, Tabor, which he won. By the time he got to Akko, he was absolutely incapable of beating back the Turkish army. This is where the campaign ended. He went back to Egypt and it was the end of Napoleon's Middle East campaign. He arrived in Akko on the 18th of March, 1799. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov arrived in Akko on the 15th of March, 1799. And he arrived in a city full of people in complete panic because Napoleon is about to come and behead them and kill them. That's what they heard from Jaffa. And the governor of Akko told all the civilians they had to leave right away. Well, where are you going to go? If we go out of the city through the land, we're going to run right into Napoleon's army. We have to go out by sea. Well, how many ships were there? How are you going to get a place on a ship? Anyway, they managed to bribe someone. With an abs- I don't know where they got the money from. They bribed someone to let them onto a civilian vessel in order for them to escape from Akka before the siege began. The siege began three days later. But Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, for all his many qualities, did not speak Arabic. And when they told him where to go, he didn't follow the directions that he was given. And he ended up in a Turkish military vessel, which immediately set sail to go into battle, a massive sea battle, against the against the French fleet (laughs) and the French fleet and the Turk and they're firing at each other and I don't know if you know anything about warfare at sea in those days it was relentless and merciless suddenly they see this Hasidic rabbi and his attendant sitting on the deck it's what are you doing here this we feel the same way can you please take us back no we can't take you back and they sent them down into a cabin And this battle continued, and they were very badly damaged. They managed to sail away from the French fleet, but they were not able to pump the water out of the ship fast enough. And they're in this cabin, and the ship is slowly filling up with water, and they're piling furniture up, and they're clambering on top of the furniture so they can save their lives. Eventually, they managed to repair the ship. Just as they finished repairing the ship, they ran into one of those Mediterranean storms, And the ship nearly went under. Eventually, they arrived in Rhodes. Well, you know what? The captain of the ship, this Turkish naval military captain, wasn't very happy with Reb Nachman of Breslov, nor with Shimon. They said to him, we'd like to get off. It's nearly Pesach. (laughs) He said, well, I'm not letting you off unless you pay me. He said, well, we don't have any money. So which one of you is more important? Well, Rabbi Nachman, you staying here and sent Shimon to the Jewish community to pay a ransom to get Rabbi Nachman off the ship. It's Erev Pesach. And they are on the ship. The Jewish community says, who is this person? He doesn't know what to tell them. He says, he's the Baal Shem Tov's great-grandson. What, the Baal Shem Tov who's mentioned in the Svarim about the Hasidic movement? Yeah, yet yeah, his great-grandson. How much does the captain want? And they paid the ransom. But Rabbi Nachman of Breslov didn't manage to get off before Pesach, and he had to spend Seder, first night and second night, on the ship in Rhodes, until he got off the boat, and then they welcomed him with open arms. They gave him all the honor and respect that should be accorded such a great rabbi. He says, okay, we've run out of money. How are we going to get... They paid passage for him on a ship to Istanbul. He um, gets to Istanbul, but his troubles were far from over. You see, when he got to Istanbul, do you remember he had to wait there a few weeks, months? And he hadn't had his papers stamped. 
So now that he got to Istanbul, they said, well, if you want to get from the Ottoman Empire to Poland, you have to have proper papers. He said, well, I don't have the papers. Well, it's going to cost you a lot of money to get new papers. So they had to bribe an official to give him a new passport. Him and Shimon got new passports. And now they travel up the Black Sea towards Galati. They were caught in another storm. Most of the passengers drowned. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, it was a, um, it wasn't a, a, a sea worthy ship and most of the, the passengers drowned but they managed to survive and they arrived in Galati they're quite happy to be on dry land and now it's just a walk or a horse and cart ride home and they were thrown immediately into jail as spies they bribed their way out of jail and spent Shavuos in Galati before setting out for Yassi in Romania and when they arrived in Yassi they were immediately put into quarantine because there was terrible epidemics of whatever illness, wherever they had come from. And they spent a couple of weeks in quarantine. Eventually they got out of quarantine and they made their way home. They'd been gone for more than a year. The trip to Israel was a game changer for Ibn Nachman. Within a year he'd moved, it was 1800, he moved to a town, a larger town called Zlatipola, set himself up as a full blown tzaddik, chassidish Rebbe. And now, having been through this, I guess, rite of passage, I don't even know what to call it, right? Incredible experience. He s- felt so negatively towards the other tzaddikim. He held them in complete contempt and he didn't keep it a secret. The following Yom Kippur, he's in Zlatipola, and they said, we'll give you the shul, we'll take good care of you. He said, no, no, just do your thing. And he's davening in shul. And after davening, they said, so what did you think of it? He said, well, I like the shul very much. But the chazan is terrible. The chazan happened to be a chosid of a nearby Hasidic rebbe called the Shpala Zayda. The Shpala Zayda is an interesting man. He was born in 1725. And he was the oldest Hasidic Rebbe alive at that time. He was 75 years old. And he knew the Baal Shem Tov. He'd been in his circle. He spent time with him. And this man came. He said, what did Rabbi Nachman say about you? He said, well, Rabbi Nachman said that if I was singing to impress God, I'm a complete failure. Because it appeared that I was singing to impress my wife. And the Shpala said, he said that? He said, yeah, not only did he say that, he said, I davened Kol Nidre. My son-in-law davened Ne'ilah. He said the same thing about him. Well, the Shpala Zayda had been the Shamas in the shul in Zlatipola before he became the Rebbe. And he came to Zlatipola after Sukkot and he said, where's this Nachman person? And he pointed him out. He said, well, you need to get out of this town. You can't stay here. So why should I get out? He said, because you're a person who's undermining the fabric of the local society, the local community. You can't be. He said, I'm a great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. I don't care who you are. You're getting out of town. Began a feud between Reb Nachman of Breslov and the Shpala Zayda over what he said about a chazan after Yom Kippur that lasted to the end of his life. And he tried... He tried to stay in Zlatipol. He couldn't stay there. After two years, he had to leave. And that's how he ended up in a place called Breslov. Because he had to leave Zlatipol. And he thought he'd go to Breslov and everything would be okay. It wasn't. (laughs) Troublemakers follow you wherever you go. And they said terrible things about him. They said he's a Sabbatean. They said he's a Frankist. They said he's a terrible influence. They said, whatever you can say negative about somebody, they said about him. And he was a very sarcastic person. He had this very sarcastic Eastern European humor, which you may be familiar with. I I read some of the things he said. I'm going to give you one of the things he said, which I think is amazing. The Shpola Zayda's name was Arya Leib. Leib was his name. So they said, how are you feeling about the Shpola Zayda? He said, listen... There's a pasuk in Tehillim, Rabot Machshavot Belev Ish. There are many um, thoughts or plans that a man has. Atzat Hashem Hitakum, but only what God wants is what finally happens. It's a pasuk in Tehillim. He said, 
רבות מחשבות בלייביש, לייב is the name, so לייביש has a lot of things that he's trying to plan against me, אבל עצת השם היא תקום, it's only what God wants that's going to happen. This was a type of remark that he would make, and it may have endeared him to his followers, but if I'm sure Reb Leib Shpola, when he heard about it, wasn't too happy. Um, Reb Nachman had his defenders, Reb Leib Yitzchok of Breditschev, Reb Shnir Zalman of Liadi, but he was an upstart Rebbe who refused to acknowledge the by now established hierarchy, that, which was very strong. Um, you know, why was the Shpola Zayda so against him? It's very hard to know. Um, there's one, one thing which I saw which said that the Shpola Zayda heard that Reb Nachman of Breslov used to serve alcohol before Shachris, which is a terrible thing apparently, which really doesn't make sense because in the Hasidic world, serving alcohol before Shachris isn't such a terrible thing. So I'm not quite sure that that story is true. There's a man called Reb Yudel Rosenberg, and if you've, any of you have got my new book, you'll know that... And the sixth chapter of the book, I talk about Rebutel Rosenberg, a very famous literary forger who invented all the stories you've ever heard about the Golem of Prague. He also wrote a book called The Shpolazeda, in which he gives his version of events as to the dispute between the Shpolazeda and Reb Nachman of Breslov. And he suggests that Reb Nachman of Breslov was too modern. And he was embracing modern ideas and ideals. And the Shpolazeda was very conservative and didn't like it. We can dismiss that, because I can't believe anything that Rebutel Rosenberg says. It's most probably fake news. Um, I want to, so much more to say, but I want to do two more things, perhaps three. Depends how much time you have. Reb Nachman moved to Breslov. It was close to his uncle, Reb Baruch, and he then fell out with Reb Baruch as well. And the reason he fell out with him is because he was this iconoclast and he refused to accept the notion that the Hasidic movement had evolved from being a revolutionary movement into being a mainstream movement, which is what happened. It's what happens to all revolutions. The first generation is very exciting. The second generation tries to be exciting. By the third generation, they're just the same as all the people they revolted against. And that's what happened to the Hasidic movement. They'd evolved into a movement with its own rules, its own regulations, its own culture, its own system. And this iconoclast was trying to break it again and be a new revolutionary at a time when there was no longer a revolution. And his uncle was very opposed to him. He did meet, though, Nosn of Nemirov, and that really saved him, not in terms of his life or his Hasidic group, because that was doomed, at least in his lifetime. He met Reb Nosson of Nemirov, the son-in-law of a misnagid, of one of the opponents of the Hasidic movement, who was from a wealthy family in Nemirov. He became devoted to Reb Nachman of Breslov. He became James Boswell to Reb Nachman's Dr. Johnson. Almost everything we know about Reb Nachman of Breslov comes from the pen of Nosson of Nemirov. Um, we don't know if he was as important as he claimed to have been uh, you know, in the various writings that he, that he delivered to us at the time Reb Nachman was alive, but he's so important to us in as much as that he's given us all the information that we know about Reb Nachman of Breslov. And one cannot overstate his importance to the existence of Breslov as a Hasidic group because without him, they would have disappeared. He lived until 1845, and even after the death of Reb Nachman, he kept the movement alive. There was no court, there was no community. They only came to Reb Nachman three times a year. They would come Rosh Hashanah, which is why they go to Uman every year in Rosh Hashanah. They would, come, um, they would come on Hanukkah, and they would come for Shavuos. The rest of the year, Reb Nachman didn't want to have anything to do with his followers. Unless you had a particular reason that you needed to be with him, he would see you, but otherwise, he didn't have a court. And starting in 1803, he went on a very aggressive messianic campaign. And he spoke about, very often he would speak in his writings, he speaks about the true tzaddik, which anybody, if they're a Breslover, knows. When he spoke about the true tzaddik, it was a coded message. He was speaking about himself. Not like all those other tzaddikim, they're not really tzaddikim, wink, wink, but the true tzaddik. And he started speaking about the true tzaddik in messianic terms. 
and slowly built himself up towards a great revelation that was going to take place, but it never took place. The Messianic campaign ended in 1806. His son died very suddenly, who was called after his great uncle, um, and he died, and that seems to have been a devastating moment for him. His wife died the following year, um, Isasia. He remarried, but that year in 1807, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Um, he was a young man, 35 years old, and he lived for another three years, and then he died. And shortly before he died, he died on October 16th, 1810. And in May, he told his Hasidim, that's it, I'm no longer staying in Breslov, I'm moving to Uman. Why are you moving to Uman? He never really said. Some people speculate because there was a terrible pogrom in Uman, and there were many um, people who were buried in unmarked graves, Jewish people, who were never visited because they had no family, entire families were wiped out. And there's some who speculate that Ibn Nachman wanted to be buried in the place where all these martyrs were buried, so at least they would have visitors because people would come and visit his grave. He certainly went to Uman because there were better doctors there and there was a more sophisticated community. It was on a crossroads. It was easier, easier for people to get to Uman than it was to get to Breslov. He moved to Uman, but there, were not, there was no religious community in Uman, only Maskilim, only enlightened Jews, not very religious Jews. But he decided that's where he wanted to live and he went and lived with Maskilim. And one of these Maskilim who played chess with him on a fairly regular basis, was a man called Hirsch Bear Horowitz. He was born in 1785. He died in 1857. And besides for playing chess with Reb Nachman, he also read him German classics. And apparently Reb Nachman liked to hear these books. His chassidim would walk in on him and they'd discover him with these maskilim, with bare heads, no beards, not very Hasidic. And there he was, their Rebbe, who they absolutely revered. He was a demigod to them, and here he was mixing with riffraff. They couldn't work it out. Anyway, this Hirschbeer Horowitz is a side story, but you know I like side stories. He later moved to England, converted to Christianity, and because he owed a lot of money in Poland, he changed his name to Herman Hedwig Bernard, <laughs> and he became a professor of Hebrew at Cambridge University. I know that um, I've gone on for quite a long time, but you know it's not over yet. You've got to give me another 10 minutes, okay? So as I said, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov did not believe in dynastic Hasidic um, systems. In other words, just because you're a Hasidic Rebbe doesn't entitle your child to become a Hasidic Rebbe. Just because you happen to be from a famous family doesn't make your family any more distinguished than the sum of its parts. You are distinguished because you yourself are distinguished. So when he died, the Hasidim decided, no Rebbe. Reb Nachman was the Rebbe. Reb Nachman was the Tzaddik. How can we replace him? And Reb Nossen Nemirova developed a system that was called the Teuter Hasidus, the dead Hasidic group. The Hasidic group that worships a dead Rebbe. And there was never a, uh, another Breslova Rebbe. In fact, he was not the Breslova Rebbe. He was Reb Nachman of Breslov. And the Hasidic group remained very small but very devoted and continued to follow in the path of first Reb Nossen and then other prominent Breslov Hasidim, and each generation would produce its own. Sometimes there were factions, sometimes they came together, but ultimately they, their loyalty was not to an individual, but to the teachings of Reb Nachman of Breslov. Okay, very nice, but what happened to his children? It's a good question, right? What happened to Reb Nachman of Breslov's descendants? So he wasn't succeeded by a son-in-law, he had daughters, he only had daughters, his son died. So, I, I did some research. I love doing research. I belong to lots of genealogical websites and all kinds of research websites which I use 
to garner information, to get information about the people I'm going to be speaking about. And, you know, I, look, I looked at the websites and tried to get some picture of who the descendants of Reb Nachman of Breslov were. And I came up with some really, really shocking information. But I'm going to come back to that, okay? <laughs> First, I want to introduce you to an actress from Australia called Lisa McCune. Now, I don't know if there's any Australians here. Uh, maybe there'll be those watching or listening. Lisa McCune is very famous because she was Constable Maggie Doyle in a program on TV called Blue Healers. She was also Lieutenant Kate McGregor in another TV series called Sea Patrol. She's won lots of awards in Australia, and she was born in 1971. And in 2016, she featured as a celebrity in an episode of a TV series that's called Who Do You Think You Are? Have you ever heard of that? Who Do You Think You Are is Celebrity Ancestry. So it goes to a celebrity, and suddenly they discover that they're descended from a cleaning lady, their great-grandmother was a cleaning lady, to a famous prime minister. Or they discover that they're related to the British royal family, right? It's one of the two or somewhere in between. Anyway, she featured, she was the central celebrity in an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? And she discovers that her great-grandfather is a man called George Christopher Bloomer. Wow. George Christopher Bloomer. Can you see the picture up there? George Christopher Bloomer. There in his uh, military uniform, he was accused of murder in the year 1908, and the person he murdered, you'll be pleased to know, was Bill Clinton. <laughs> there was a sensational trial in which the real murderer was discovered and sentenced to death, and this George Christopher Bloomer, Lisa McCune's uh, great-grandfather, was given six months as an accessory. Apparently, he assisted somewhat in the... In the uh, uh, you're taking the body and hiding it so that nobody should find it. Well, there you go. That's the story. Um, he enlisted in World War I. Uh, he was wounded right away, and he re-enlisted in 1916. And he was wounded again, and then he was mustard-gassed in France in 1917, and he returned to Australia in 1918. He went through quite a lot, this poor chap, George Christopher Bloomer. And, and you're probably wondering, why is any of this relevant? Can we have the first family tree? There you go. George Christopher Bloomer. His son was Colin George. His grandson was Malcolm. And his great-granddaughter is Lisa McCune. Can we have the second family tree, please? Okay, there you go. George Christopher Bloomer's mother was Mary Jane Bloomer, whose mother was Bridget Kellington, and her parents were Mary Brennan, real name Miriam, daughter of Chaya Klutskar Zaslavsky, whose father was Reb Nachman of Breslov. Now, who did she marry? Miriam married Michael Brennan. His name wasn't actually Michael. His name was Moshe. And his father was Reb Nossen of Nemirov. Now, you're wondering, how do you get from Nemirov to Brennan? Can we have the next slide, please? No, the next one. Oh, there you go. Brennan. Ben Rebnosum Nemirova. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it, what you can find out? So Lisa McCune is descended from Reb Nachman of Breslau. By the way, that did not come up in the TV program. Now, if you look at these websites, and I, I've, taken, I've just taken a snapshot of some of the websites... There is an entire industry of websites dedicated to finding Reb Nachman of Breslov's descendants. I bet you didn't know that. I didn't know it. And you can't imagine the things that they say about Reb Nachman of Breslov's descendants. You see, how did Michael Brennan marry Mary? Do you know how that happened? Because they fell under the influence of the son of the Alta Rebbe, of Reb Shnir Zalman of Liadi, Reb Moshe ben Reb Shnir Zalman, who changed his name from Moshe ben Shnir Zalman and became a Catholic and was a malign influence in the Hasidic world because despite the fact that nobody converted in those days, can you imagine? People did convert to Christianity to further their careers and their livelihoods. And he managed to convert an entire swathe of Hasidic Jews in, in uh, Eastern Europe, including the son of Reb Nossen Nemirova, 
and the granddaughter of Reb Nachman of Breslov, and they moved to Ireland, where they changed their name to Brennan, and then they had all these children, including this George Christopher Bloomer, who killed Bill Clinton in 1908. Didn't, by the way. He wasn't found guilty. The problem is, of course, that none of this is true. And um, for all of you amateur researchers out there who use genealogical websites, you really need to know what you're doing. Because if you look at genealogical websites, I'll give you just this one, jenny.com, of which I'm a member, lists Rav Nachman of Breslov as having had 10 children. But we know he only had eight. So how does he have 10 children? Well, it's really important that he has 10 children if you want some of his descendants to be Frankist, Sabbatean Catholics who live in Ireland. Because otherwise, where are they going to come from? So they invent family trees which trace their way back to great Hasidic rabbis and then they produce so-called information, but which are really conspiracy theories, that promote the idea that these great rabbis, in fact, one of the websites describes Reb Nachman as having travelled with his second wife in 1808 and converted to Catholicism together with all his children and... Therefore, all his descendants are also Christians. But that's not enough. You see, it's not sufficient for me to just dismiss it on the basis of me not believing it. I want to give you some... It's circumstantial evidence, but then again, don't consider the fact that any of this evidence is online as being anything more than circumstantial evidence. First of all, Reb Nossen Nemirova wrote extensively about himself. We have his letters. He doesn't mention anywhere that he had a son called Moshe. I think he would have probably known had he had a son called Moshe. Doesn't mention him anywhere. He does mention Moshe, the son of Rav Shnir Zalman. That means the one who confirmed. We know that that's true. That story is true. That did happen. He mentions him, but not in connection with anything connected to him. He just mentions him as this aberrant son of a great Hasidic leader. Um, Breslov, as I haven't described, but which I think was evident from the life of Reb Nachman, it went on to be one of the most fiercely opposed Hasidic groups in the history of Hasidism. On that basis, don't you think if Reb Nachman had a granddaughter and Reb Nossen had a son who converted to Catholicism that we would have heard about it then, that we wouldn't have had to wait until Jenny.com came up with it in the year 2018? Um, Reb Nossen's son marrying Reb Nachman's granddaughter, I think, would have been something that might have been mentioned in Breslov literature. That's quite something. The main disciple's son marries the granddaughter of the founding rabbi. That's quite a story, not mentioned once anywhere. And finally, Frankism, which seems to have been the source of all this, was long over by the early 1800s, and the idea that Reb Nachman or any of his descendants would have flirted with Frankism or Sabbateanism after the year 1800 is frankly ridiculous. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not saying that Reb Nachman doesn't have any descendants who are either irreligious or could be Gentiles. It's possible. Anything is possible. But you certainly can't take the word of um, some amateur genealogist who's looking for an interesting uh, antecedent to spice up their family tree as gospel truth. Thank you. <laughs>